from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, as the government prepares to reopen, infrastructure finds its way to the table. Plus, meet a top producer finalist from Wisconsin, an agribusiness tracking basis. You know, we've got 30 days here before cash rents are due and, and we need to generate some cash. And the majesty of our national parks with or without a shutdown. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. While the federal government was shut down Monday and most federal agencies were closed, we did learn more about the administration's plan to improve the nation's bridges, highways, and waterways. An advanced copy of the Trump infrastructure plan came out. It spells out the priorities and how to pay for the work. Focusing on farm country, the Rural Infrastructure Program is designed to encourage investment to enable rural economies. The plan would prioritize repairs on roads, bridges, rail, and inland waterways mentioned in the document, allowing states the flexibility to toll on interstates and then reinvest the toll and those revenues back into infrastructure. Now also on the priority list, broadband and other high-speed data, a focus on drinking water and wastewater. There would also be improvements to the electric grid. Typically, all presidential administrations roll out major initiative prior to the State of the Union address as a trial balloon, so to speak. The address happens one week from today. The federal government is set to open again after Senate Democrats and Republicans came to terms on another short-term spending bill, but the issue over immigration still lingers. Senate Democrats supported a three-week stopgap bill after a commitment from GOP leaders to consider immigration legislation. That's the first step toward reopening federal agencies through February 8th. The shutdown began Saturday. Moderates from both parties pressured leaders to end the shutdown and compromise. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said Democrats agreed to back the bill reopening the government after he and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell agreed to begin debating an immigration bill also on February 8th. I've been having conversations with the Republican leader over the weekend about a path forward. After several discussions, offers, counter offers, the Republican leader and I have come to an arrangement. I think we've learned anything during this uh, process. It's that a strategy to shut down the government over the issue of illegal immigration is something the American people didn't understand and would not have understood in the future. So I'm glad we've gotten past that. Despite Monday's deal, it only postpones the more deeply divided debate over immigration. The partisan stalemate over the budget, forcing scores of federal government agencies, including USDA, to close their doors over the weekend and into Monday. This is what we found on USDA's websites yesterday before the congressional vote. USDA's main page, the NAS site, and the WADSI website, all showing that they were up but were not getting updated. Mike Hoffman joining us now to look at crop comments from North and South Dakota. Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Buck Becker over in Bismarck, North Dakota. Says the wind has calmed down. Now the area is experiencing some fog. The Bismarck area should see highs in the 30s until Friday. Here's a fun fact for you. Monday marked the 75th anniversary of a weather event that put Spearfish, South Dakota in the record books. Within just two minutes, the temperature in Spearfish, South Dakota jumped from a negative four to 45 degrees. On January 22, 1943, the weather cracked windows and frosted car windows, which forced drivers to pull over. Unbelievable. I do remember, I, well, I wasn't there, but I do remember that record. There's the wind speed forecast. Pretty windy with this storm system moving through the uh, upper uh, Midwest, Great Lakes, into the mid-Atlantic states during the day today. As we head into the uh, day tomorrow, then, what we're going to see is uh, a lot of the wind shifts into the northeastern parts of the country and also into the western sections as the next storm system starts to come in. I'll have your forecast coming up, but first, here are some hometown tips. Ag Day. Brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest lasting heavy duty pickups. This week, Top Producer Seminar kicks off in Chicago. Hundreds of the nation's biggest agricultural producers are on hand discussing the business challenges facing the industry in 2018. 
Also during the week, Top Producer Magazine announces its Top Producer of the Year, and this year's three finalists have already been chosen. We got a tour of each operation, and over the next few days, we'll share their stories. Today, we begin in Hancock, Wisconsin, with Heartland Farms. Driving around Heartland Farms. All these buildings that we're going around right now are, uh, are potato storages. You'll see storage for potatoes, potatoes, and more potatoes. And to put it in perspective, it's about the size of a football field. This Hancock, Wisconsin operation is one of the largest suppliers of chip potatoes in the country. We've gone from what was 1,100 acres to about 23 or 24,000 in that 40 year period. Shipping 30 to 40 semi loads a day, Heartland Farms is moving a quarter of the potatoes in a facility this size each and every day. If you don't treat them well, they will get cranky and, uh, and die and rot. Everything that we grow is contracted before we plant it. So we're not exposed to the, the big swings in the open market. And the idea of being a steady supplier is one reason Richard Pavelski and partner Dave Knight started this business. Dick had ran into some people in, uh, in a John Hancock seminar uh, that were key in Frito-Lay that were talking about trying to go to what they called unit suppliers. I think life in general is, is a sense of uh, when opportunities present themselves, are you prepared to take them on? And you never seem to know when they're coming. <laughs> An opportunity that's paying off. The farm and the business is growing rapidly. The company just built the most advanced bulk potato rinse and shipping facility in the world. Chip segment is actually one of the most demanding and challenging segments of the potato industry. To keep up, it even tracks friability. We're taking a fry sample and a sugar sample every two weeks, and then we'll put it up there so we can visually see here if this is changing from one week to another. Potatoes are a perishable product, so we're utilizing a lot of information determining when we're going to ship this bit. Just one metric, one data point in the thousands this operation is collecting on a daily basis. If you take an analytical approach and make decisions that are based upon data rather than emotion, in the long run, you're going to come out better. I mean, uh, the devil is always in the details. Details built on data, driven by cutting edge technology. Spudge is the name of one of the softwares that we design here that tracks everything from our inventory to our shipments to the quality information to the agronomy information and keeps it all in one nice little neat area. To me, you're either on the leading edge or the bleeding edge, and we have been on the bleeding edge a few times. It's cost us a little money, but that you know, just part of it. They credit their ability to overcome and be successful to a team. And I think you've heard us all talk about it. It's people, people, people. Uh, without good, dedicated people, um, you know, you, you can't make it very far. Training and communication remain key. And this past year, leaders even held a state of the farm address for employees. Open it up for any questions, not just that the employees have, but also their families. Proving dedication to the bottom line. There's a lot of costs that you can incur on small things if you're not paying attention to them. High quality, cutting edge technology, and good people are still helping to drive success, no matter the size. We still consider this a family farm, and when people say, well, how can that still be a family farm at that size of operation? And my answer to that is, it's the kind of family farm you build when you do it for 130 years with five generations. Congratulations to Heartland Farms, a finalist for Top Producer of the Year. Tomorrow we're headed to the farm fields of North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. We'll meet a farmer that's grown from a dozen acres as a teenager to one of the biggest producers in the southeast. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about basis and the difference in the eastern corn belt versus the west, and later taking in the majesty of America's national parks, regardless of the Washington chaos. Another mega merger in the agricultural industry now possibly being discussed. Bloomberg reporting ADM is asking Bungie for talks. A combined ADM Bungie would be a commodity trading giant with an international network of barges and marine terminals and a major industrial enterprise with factories and refineries. ADM or Bungie have declined to comment on any potential merger. 
in agribusiness. Let's see how the trading week started. For that, we head to the floor of the CME in Chicago. There have been some quiet market, markets uh, really today, but uh, the sentiment has turned a little bit higher. It seems like corn is solidly off its contract lows and has a little bit of a boost. There is some help from some dry weather in South America, and that's really what's helping soybeans because soybeans was up again today. That Argentine crop is really facing hot and dry weather, and it's really at a critical stage for the beans. And this is the time where uh, you know the flowering uh, is happening, and if those flowers fall off, they will not be able to produce a pod all that uh, being said, that's given uh, the soybeans uh, a real boost and it's been up for the sixth day in a row. So we're watching that very closely. Uh, wheat also rebounded and that has a, a totally different weather uh, issue that right now there's dryness in the south and in the western plains and that has the traders uh, very concerned that this extreme drought is really beginning to worry uh, some of the people. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGathy. Garrett Toy, Ag Trader Talk, our guest here at the Agribusiness Desk today. Garrett, so as we kind of, at some point, we know a lot of folks are going to have to start selling grain, right. moving grain, and that's when basis often comes into play. Right. What do you think about basis and some of these cash sales? Well, you're absolutely right. You know, we've got 30 days here before cash rents are due, and, and we need to generate some cash. Um, you look at the, the, the stocks report, you know, the on-farm stocks are larger in soybeans than they were this point last year. The exception being Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Eastern Corn Belt bean stocks are flat. You know, okay. all, all those extra bean stocks are out in the Western Corn Belt. And uh, so that's going to mean that your basis in the Western Corn Belt probably is going to appreciate uh, as, as well. Um, it also means that uh, from here on out, you know, if you're going to have additional movement or for meal demand, it's going to be from a Western Corn Belt that typically has a little bit lighter protein. Okay. Um, on the on the corn side, we've got stocks that are pretty much the exact same as last year. Um, the, the crude oil... Uh, rally. We've had it's actually this talk that the, the Brazil may lift the 20% the tariff on ethanol. We've had a seven cent rally in ethanol that's helped these margins. They're not great, but they're back to you know to levels where you might start seeing some basis appreciation in, the, in the ethanol plants. Okay. Well, all of those things tied together kind of give uh, a little bit of a strategy. So when whenever I go into the elevator or wherever I'm selling my grain, uh, what are your thoughts on on how to make that action? Take well, that action. Well, I mean, I think your best bet right now uh, is you look at some basis contracts or, or just spot it out uh, here on, on the on the backside. You can come on the board and defend those sales, even though I, you know you've got carries in the market. You never know what the large spec short that we get some sort of uh, uh, rally uh, uh, potential but you know I think the one thing to keep in mind is in the deferreds is that if you're looking at selling these carries just be cognizant if you do an HTA or something of that sort that you probably aren't going to see that much basis appreciation it's always okay. kind of nice to keep that open but yeah but you know considering the more forward sales it might be limited all right well, good insights appreciate you for being here thank you so much we'll be back with more ag day just now to contact Garrett, call him at 888-745-2020 or find him at agtradertalk.com. Ag Day, brought to you by Credenz Soybean Seed from Bayer. Designed using smart genetics with tailored varieties to fit any field condition. Welcome back to Ag Day. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman here looking at what uh, may be shaping up as a stormy pattern as we get through the middle of January. Yeah, and I think we're probably looking at a couple weeks of it before we go back to the okay. cold in the east and the warm in the west. But uh, that's a whole other story. We'll start with the big storm in the east. It was a big snowstorm as it came across the upper Midwest from southern Minnesota back into uh, parts of Nebraska, South Dakota. Lots of snow in those areas, and you can see it is still snowing pretty good in the uh, northern portions of the Great Lakes. The back side of it, we're going to see maybe an inch or two of snow into the Chicagoland area and uh, parts of Indiana. Uh, the cold front will continue to push east with showers and even thunder showers along it. That will uh, continue uh, eastward and by later today be into central Florida and also into uh, central New England. But on the back side, again, some snow showers. Now, that next storm system, uh, this is going to be another powerful one as it comes eastward. It won't get into the eastern parts of the country until the weekend. But nonetheless, we are looking at uh, lots of rain and mountain snows in the Pacific Northwest uh, as we head through the day today. Day. Heading through tonight, it doesn't really shift too much farther east, as you can see, just lingering snow showers and in the uh, mid atlantic well, let's say the central Appalachians on up into the uh, northeast. Otherwise, it's just kind of chilly through here. This is not real cold air. This is Pacific air, not Arctic air like we've been seeing a lot of. 
And as we head through the day tomorrow, it starts to warm right back up into the northern and central plains, and the cold front will continue to come in. There's going to be a lot of energy coming in with this storm system, so there'll be uh, southern areas of low pressure kind of forming as that heads eastward across the Rockies as well. Precipitation estimate over the past 24 hours, lots of it east of the Mississippi and also into the northern Mississippi River Valley. Adding in the next 36 hours, <clears throat> most of it's going to fall into the uh, northeast, eastern Great Lakes, a little bit into Florida and then a whole bunch along the uh, coastlines of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Snowfall then, there's, there's the amounts that we've seen over a foot in parts of the area. That came with a lot of wind as well, so it was near blizzard conditions at times across the uh, upper Midwest. And over the next 36 hours then, we're going to see a little bit of that fall into the uh, Great Lakes area. Central Appalachians and throughout the Northeast. Northern Rockies going to get some as well. High temperatures today, you can see behind this front, not bitterly cold, 30s and 40s for the most part. Uh, as you can see uh, tonight, into the 30s and 40s in the Southeast. That's pretty cold for you folks, but still teens in the Northern Plains. And we already start to warm things back up from Texas into uh, North Dakota by tomorrow afternoon. There's the storm system itself in the jet stream. Quick shot of cold air behind it. Then we go warmer again. Next storm system coming east, you can see with that trough. All in all, though, that's a pretty mild weather pattern coast to coast. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. Heading to Elko, Nevada, first of all, mixture of clouds and sunshine, high of 41 degrees. Rochester, Minnesota, after all that snow, just mostly cloudy, breezy, and colder, high of 23. And Aiken, South Carolina, clouds giving way to sunshine, high up to 63. When we come back, we'll check in on the dairy industry and the margin challenges facing producers and later, shut down or not, the national parks entertain visitors over the weekend. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing. Farmer first with a plan for every market. From our partners at Milk Magazine, as dairy prices continue to drop, margins in the Western Corn Belt are falling. According to economists at the University of Nebraska, net revenues fell by nearly $1 per hundred in December. Half of the decline in net revenue came from rising feed costs. And in California, dairy producers are petitioning the state for an emergency increase in base milk prices for the next 12 months. The Western United Dairymen and the California Dairy Campaign say many producers are in dire financial situations. California milk production has declined in 32 of the past 36 months. Economic conditions appear even more dire going into 2018, with milk prices projected to fall below $13 per hundred, with losses continuing to rise. And last week, California Dairies Incorporated announced it was closing one of its six dairy plants due to falling milk production. Later today, the monthly milk production report is scheduled to come out, but with Monday's shutdown, our partners at Farm Journal's Milk don't expect that report to be issued. A government shutdown didn't close some of the nation's most iconic parks to tourists. We'll have those details next. Ag Day, brought to you by Corvus, the number one pre-emergence corn herbicide. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota, tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit Kubota.com today. The government shutdown may be over for now, but even during the stalemate, visitors were still enjoying the nation's national parks. Visitors could still venture into Yellowstone National Park over the weekend. Tourists were there riding snowmobiles and skiing to marvel at the geysers and buffalo herds. Visitor centers, public toilets, and other facilities run by the national park were closed, however. The shutdown topping people's mind even as access to the park continued. This is our public land and we should be able to use it anytime we want to. And unfortunately, you know, the park employees, I don't know if they're going to get paid or not, but um, and I don't know who decides that it's going to be a partial shutdown or a full shutdown, but it is what it is and Congress better get their act together. Yellowstone had two inches of fresh snow on Saturday and temperatures in the teens. The visitor centers, those public toilets and other facilities run by the service were closed, but privately operated hotels, tour services, and gift shops were still open. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Start your day with us. For Mike Hoffman, all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. 
Ag Day, brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups.